people issues will be um, um, will be resolved. Okay, so our third session of the uh, seventh European Marine Board Forum is on the digital twin ocean. Um, and can I get the next slide? Just a reminder for those of you who have been here or haven't been here, um, housekeeping rules. Again, please use the uh, chat for technical and question and answers for any questions. Um, when you put the question in the question and answer, please state who the question is for and uh, be good to have your full name. Um, and once we get to the questions and answers from the, from the participants, I will read them out to the panelists um, and the speakers. And I will, and, and some of them might answer it in, in, in type, but I might still ask them to, to just give, uh, give it in, um, out in, in words. Um, one other thing to remind you is that we are basically recording this webinar. Um, it's being live streamed on YouTube. Um, and the recording will be available on YouTube later um, after the forum. So next slide is, um, I, um, I want to introduce the, our um, next speaker. It is, I've gone over the page, it's Neil Davies. He is the um, director of the University of California's Gump South Pacific Research Station in Maria, in Maria and French Polynesia. And he's a senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Uh, he's got a background in zoology and genetics. And as far as I know, he's not on the call yet. He is in French Polynesia. It is 12 hours from here, from now. So it's half past three in the morning for him. Um, so we're hoping that he will arrive to answer questions um, during the panel discussion. Um, so if we can take his video, then um, hopefully... Good afternoon. It's an honor to be invited to talk to you today. I just wish that I could be there in person, but perhaps it's appropriate that my digital avatar is representing me. They say no man is an island, perhaps that's true, but we all live on one. I grew up in Europe where we are accustomed to this view of the planet. Centering the view on the island of Morea, where I live now, gives a whole new perspective, revealing the Earth's largest feature, the Pacific Ocean, which is nearly half of the global ocean and one third of the Earth's surface. French Polynesia has one of the world's largest exclusive economic zones of some 5 million square kilometers, and Morea is exceptional in hosting two international research stations, Francis Creog since 1971 and the University of California's Gump Station since 1985. Just a bit on my background, I'm a geneticist and evolutionary biologist by training. And for the last 20 years, I've been director of the Gump Station here on Morea, and more recently a research affiliate at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. The Gump Station supports research on land and sea spanning physical, biological, and social sciences, as well as the humanities. For example, we host the only coral reef site in the US National Science Foundation's long-term ecological research network of place-based programs collecting highest quality time series data across different ecosystem types. And Moria is part of a growing global network and associated data infrastructures. The Gump Station is located on Polynesian land called Atatia, and since 2002, half of our property is managed by the Tahitian community based organization Tepu Atatia, focused on traditional knowledge, culture, and educational programs. With the Gump Station and Atatia Center side by side, we have a unique opportunity to explore synergies between local traditional knowledge and global scientific understanding. An example of research collaboration between Gump Station, Creob, Tepuatitia, and other institutions was the 2008 Morea Biocode project, which digitally imaged and genetically sequenced all the animals and plants and many of the fungi on the island from the reefs to the mountaintops. The overarching context for everything we do is to address the environmental and social crises facing the world and to help achieve the United Nations 2030 sustainability agenda. One of the major scientific challenges in this effort involves connecting the changes happening at large scales in climate, economy, or public health to local impacts. And the feedbacks from local, even microscopic scales to those global processes 
For example, we can now envisage deliberately manipulating the planetary genome to geoengineer the Earth. But we must proceed with great care and humility, as our understanding of complex ecosystems is still relatively primitive, as the current pandemic sorely exposes. If humanity and the rest of life on Earth is to successfully navigate the next few decades, we will need to develop much greater capacity for social ecological foresight. To that end, following a conference on quantum computing on Morea, uh, Matthias Troyer convened a workshop in late 2013 at ETH Zurich to consider the rather outlandish proposition of modeling entire social ecological systems from genes to satellites and developing computational simulations of those systems. At that time, large-scale modeling was becoming capable of simulating changes across the entire Pacific Ocean, and ecological understanding of the drivers of coral bleaching was sufficient to allow quite accurate forecasting of local-scale impacts. But we needed to take this much further. Large-scale models are necessary for global processes like climate change and ocean acidification. But we also need to know how organisms respond to these changes and feed back into the system. In ocean acidification, for example, how does the calcification process respond to lower pH in different species of coral? In other words, we must study the Earth from genome up and planet down. To do so, we must integrate data, models, and understanding across scales and disciplines. Morea has many of these elements in place given its intensive history of scientific research, but integration also takes coordination of standards, best practices, and knowledge infrastructures worldwide. Understanding the planet from genome up is a vastly complex task, but we've addressed overwhelming complexity in science before. In biomedicine, for example, we've made great progress using simple model organisms like the fruit fly. We can do the same thing in sustainability science, using small islands as our model social ecological systems. At the 2013 workshop in Zurich, inspiration and expertise came from urban data science initiatives, such as ETH's Future Cities Lab in Singapore, and also from systems biology and new approaches in personalized medicine seeking to avoid diseases and maintain wellness. From these, we developed a roadmap for systems ecology. It began with a more complete parts list which in this case involves sequencing the island and then progressively understanding interactions among those parts, building towards a digital representation of the social ecological system, what we called an island digital ecosystem avatar. The goal was to enable holistic use-oriented simulations that would support local decision-making for sustainable development. A roadmap was published in 2016 uh, together with a framework, and this engaged over 80 scientists from some 20 institutions. Our mission was to understand how the island would change over the next few decades depending on human actions. And crucially, this would involve understanding history, describing the state of the island today in unprecedented detail, and then simulating different scenarios of the future. So that was a brief overview of the Island Avatar Initiative. For the rest of my time, I'll respond to the questions I was asked to reflect upon. Our approach can be summarized in this slide. We aim to reduce the overwhelming complexity at the global scale by focusing on small model systems where we can concentrate resources and make scientific headway. It generates more than just big data. The key point is more complete data and an understanding of what all the components contribute. We believe that the knowledge and tools gained from these model ecosystems can scale horizontally and help move all places toward greater resilience. And while humans might be more present in managing natural areas, so too might nature be more present in the built environment. We must collaborate with other species in ways that help all life on Earth thrive. Broad elements of this approach and the values underpinning it increasingly resonate across many independent yet complementary initiatives. Hopefully this reflects a growing momentum towards sustainability. 
In terms of machine learning and AI, there is, of course, great potential. And Global Fishing Watch, which perhaps you're familiar with, is maybe one of the best examples that I've seen. However, while projects on Morea are using machine learning and AI, it is generally limited to applications within disciplines. Yet there is increasing progress in truly addressing the entire social ecological system, as exemplified by the pioneering work of Joaquim Claudet, Laurie Thio, and colleagues. They have demonstrated how social ecological foresight might be operationalized to guide management decisions, and machine learning and artificial intelligence will undoubtedly accelerate this process. So while we are getting close, uh, barriers remain in how to connect computational models across scales and disciplines, but also simply the availability of high quality data is still a problem. Machines, even intelligent ones, are not built with all the answers preloaded. They need to learn just like humans do. And just as we need books and libraries, machines need well-described data. Recognizing this, governments around the world have been recommending the creation of open data standards and repositories or trusts that provide access for machines to high quality data sets. The fair data principles are a huge advance, but as with many technology driven trends, it is important to consider who benefits and whether the current institutional frameworks are fair in the sense of equity and justice. Many of the technologies and best practices exist already, so our focus is now on how to accelerate adoption. This means addressing incentives and social interoperability, including ethical, legal, and social issues. So what have we learned from the last five to 10 years of working on island avatars? Personally, despite all the high-tech progress, I've become more convinced that people are of overarching importance in moving for both the science and, and certainly in, in ensuring it adds value for society. In particular, I believe there's a real need and opportunity to connect the public, especially local communities, directly with science. To finish, I'll finally consider digital twins, a phenomenon that has been growing in prominence while we've been working on the island avatars and where there appears to be much synergy. I'd like to acknowledge the Open Data Institute who are doing fantastic work on the digital twin concept, as well as the Center for Digital Built Britain. Their work has much influenced my concluding remarks here. An important feature of digital twins, as many define them, is the loop between sensing, processing, and intervention. It is also recognized that the digital twin concept is not always appropriate. Indeed, in social ecological systems, building a realistic digital twin is extremely challenging, and it is absolutely unrealistic to think we can ever make precise predictions. So perhaps, sadly, an island can have no twin. Or maybe not. The UK is building a national digital twin. Uh, their approach is to federate individual digital twins and like the FAIR data principles, perhaps, they have proposed the Gemini principles. Very clever. There are interesting parallels in the approaches between this digital twin and the island avatars. Which leads me to a few ideas for the future. First, I'd like to suggest that our social ecological concept of an avatar corresponds to a web of digital twins. Interactions among these digital twins represents a new field of virtual ecology that can deliver social ecological foresight. A key point is how a foresight commons would articulate with decision making, and I believe this fits well with new political science theory around democratic reasoning, as championed so eloquently by Ellen Landemore at Yale, for example. Second, these avatars of social ecological units should be combined with new ways of engaging science community dialogue in the political process. For example, through the use of deliberative democratic tools like citizens assemblies. These could be developed for a number of different systems around Europe and overseas Europe, 
For example, in addition to Morea, there are already sister avatar programs in Sweden and Greece that would be wonderful to link up and expand. Finally, the local scale avatars must interact with each other as well as being nested in larger systems. These inter-avatar relations require a new paradigm for connecting science, politics, and diplomacy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. I think we still don't have Neil, so we can't take any questions to him at the moment. But if people have questions, please put them in the question and answer, and we will get them to him, and he can answer your questions later. I think uh, what they've done there has been a great um, success story, and it's, it's a really interesting concept for the new digital to an ocean. Um, so now we're going to go to the panel discussions. <clears throat> we have um, five people on the panel this afternoon, and unlike this morning, I'm going to introduce them all and then I'm going to ask one question and they're all going to answer the same question. Um, so I think we have Christian back after I rudely uh, muted him before. Uh, Christian, are you there? Are we there? Anyway, we have um, Christian Kirschteiger. He's a policy officer uh, within the e-infrastructure and science cloud unit at DG Connect. Um, which is the unit that's responsible for the initiatives in relation to developing the more convergent European high performance computing, uh, cloud and artificial intelligence infrastructures, um, and specifically the Green Deals Destination Earth Initiative. Then we have Fabian Jacques. She's a policy officer in the Copernicus unit of uh, DG Defence, uh, Defence Industry and Space within European Commission, it's called. Uh, and that's the unit in charge of marine service, the evolution um, of the services at midterm and, and monitoring in uh, the central ocean. Then we have Marilor Gregoire. Um, she is a FNRS research director and professor of marine ecosystem modeling at Liège University. Um, she's in, in also involved with Copernicus Marine Environment um, and Monitoring Environment and Monitoring Service. Uh, she's got a background in physical engineering and applied sciences, um, focusing on numerical models coupled physics and biogeochemistry. We have Serge Scori. He's the head of the Belgian Marine Data Center and the chair of Sea Data Net. Uh, he has a background in construction engineering and oceanology. Um, and he's per previously managed supercomputing infrastructures for Belgium. And then finally, last but not least, we have Kate Larkin. She's the head of marine knowledge and research at Seascape Belgium and the deputy head of the EMUTNET Secretariat. We've heard quite a bit about EMUTNET today so far. Um, her background is in deep sea biogeochemistry and she's worked uh, previously with us at the Marine Board Secretariat. So my question to you, um, and I don't know if you all want to put your videos on, that'd be great if you can. Um, my question to you, first question is, what question can we answer with a digital twin ocean that we cannot answer, which we couldn't be answered before? Um, and I'm not sure if we can hear Christian you want to answer? Otherwise, Fabian, do you want to go first? We can't hear you, Fabian. Okay. Now I have my <laughs> I'm Good afternoon, everyone. So what could we answer with the, the digital twin ocean? So I'm, I'm coming from DigiDefis. I'm working on the Copernicus program. So I would like to tell you, first of all, that we do not start from scratch. We have already uh, done quite a lot at the Commission level to um, uh, develop uh, a sort of digital uh, ocean, uh, typically with the Copernicus Marine Service and, and the Copernicus Climate Change Service. That's what we have done in, in Copernicus. Uh, so we did a lot. We are providing forecasting and so on, but we can always do more. And that's where destination Earth can be valuable and the digital twin ocean in particular. So what, what could we do more? First of all, uh, we have to remind uh, what is about destination Earth. So Christian should have described it. So this is really about advancing significantly in terms of Earth modeling, in terms of using AI, bringing innovation, uh, com coming from the digital world, but also linking different types of science, social, 
uh, oceanography and, and, and biology and so on. Um, so what I would like to see, in fact, in the digital twin ocean, first of all, in Copernicus, we will keep operating an ocean forecasting centers and ocean climate centers. It will be made available, but we we are providing core services, I would say, and we are there to help administration, the business sector, and so on, to develop their own solution. So first of all, from destination health, I think we can um, we can catch a larger community of users that would be very interesting to get, especially because we really want to to go downstream and link with ecology, link with the social science and so on, as it was presented before, and which was extremely interesting in terms of models. So this is something that could bring destination as, as already um, experienced in the idea and in the Pacific Island. So it was really a very good presentation on that. So uh, first, so I would say destination as and the digital twin ocean should help us scaling up this downstream use of science, downstream use of Copernicus and so on, and propose new forms of exchanges and collaborative work so that we can integrate the whole chain um, to support uh, a better use of our planet. Second, it's to go beyond scientifically and address what else we cannot address in Copernicus, for example, that could be the last mile, the link with the local, Thinking global but going local would be very interesting in destination health. So, meaning working in terms of high, very high resolution, addressing coast, beaches, islands, uh, connection with rivers and the, the, the connection with the land, but at local scale for local decision makers or citizens. And then also addressing uh, other branches of, uh, of the ocean which are less. Uh, digitalized today, or at least at, at a large scale, which is uh, the marine biology and the biodiversity. This is something that is lacking. We have science available, we have plenty of motivated people, but we don't have an overall framework to organize that and deliver something that can be uh, trustful, uh, um, trustable, that can be um, available all the time to support everyone in the, in the frame of biodiversity. So maybe this is something very important. So very high resolution to go to the cost, to, the, to go to the people and, and biodiversity in terms of science and then scale up, um, uh, define new ways of working. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, okay, Marilor, do you wanna have a go <clears throat> as a question? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you for having uh, invited me to this uh, forum. So, uh, as already said by uh, Fabian uh, in Copernicus, we already have are starting to build this digital ocean. So, I will not uh, add on that. Uh, about the question that we, we can think we will answer in, in the future, uh, there are many, but I decided to, to speak about some that are linking uh, the oceans. You're muted, Marilor, all of, all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. You didn't, you didn't hear anything? No, no, you, uh, you said for now uh, the ocean and then you were gone. Okay, so I, 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 so I have uh, in the question, so I, I would like to stress on the so what question that uh, will interlink the change in the ocean and the humans. And among these questions that I, I would like to stress this afternoon is, for instance, the anticipation of change in the environment and adaptation. Uh, for instance, adaptation of marine activities to the forecast of risk in the environment, risk of environmental damages. You can adapt the marine activity and decide, for instance, if you expect to have a high pressure in the area, not to add the pressure for, uh, from a marine activity. And uh, also information can be used by marine activity. For instance, uh, aquaculture can use uh, estimation of risk of hypoxia and harmful algal bloom or jellyfish outbreaks. So it's more adaptation and anticipation here. Then I also think that uh, we'll be able to provide better solution to urgent problems. Uh, and for instance, it could be done through adaptation of the observing system and of the model uh, that we are running for a better solution. And this can be done to the, to, to the building of a global web of uh, connecting sensor and model 
that would allow uh, fast detection and tracking of problem, for instance, pollution problem. Uh, this can be detected from the observing system, from space and from in situ. And this uh, observing system can be coordinated with a model in order to, to find the, the, the best place where to run the model with a high resolution. And the model can feed the observing system in order to adapt the sampling strategy where the problem uh, is, uh, uh, is happening and where the problem will be the most serious. So it's really this uh, integration between an adaptation of the modeling and of the observing capacity. Then, of course, there is this uh, mapping of ecosystem services, but Fabian already talked about that. It's the fact that we will have access to high resolution, almost high resolution, or almost always increasing high resolution information. And for the biology, it's very crucial because as it is now, we do not have the right scale to, to tackle the biology, but in the future, we expect to have the, the, the right resolution to address biology and to address problems with the biodiversity and to connect with the humans. And also as ecosystem services, uh, I have in mind climate regulation. We expect also to have progress with the CO2 uh, estimation from space. And this can be integrated also in models for uh, a better quantification of the sequestration of the CO2 by the ocean. Then um, another type of question that I think uh, are very important for the future is question that will require an earth system approach. So the digital ocean is a part of the digital earth and uh, being part of the dig digital earth, it will allow to, to have this earth system approach instead of uh, silo thinking. And this will allow to, to tackle a problem that require to link the different reservoirs, so the land, the rivers, the atmosphere, and the ocean. And this is a priority for Copernicus, for the marine Copernicus, to make this connection. And doing this connection, you are able to uh, answer overreaching question. And here I take an example of a question in the Arctic. And then if you are able to connect the different reservoir, you will be, for instance, able to, to address question about how the Arctic warming can impact the permafrost can impact the browning of the rivers, algal bloom, and loss of the sea ice, and how these different impacts can interact together. And then there is also, of, of course, extreme events, how extreme events will impact the sea level, storm surge, etc. That's what it will affect the people, so to connect to the people. And there is also the new problem that will arise in the future. And my last point will be about the unknown problem that we do not know now, and then we have to be ready to address this problem. And for being ready, uh, we really have to think about a multidisciplinary digital twin ocean instead of having a digital twin ocean just targeted for one application. It has to be uh, ready for, for multiple questions. So and that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Marilo. That was quite comprehensive. Okay, Paris, do you want to have a go? So just a reminder for those of you, the answer, the question is, what could we answer with a digital twin ocean that we couldn't answer before? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I should have coordinated with Marie-Laure because she was she took the words out of my mouth uh, uh, because I was uh, willing to limit myself from the data man management perspective, in the broad sense. And to say that um, an answer I would like to have, and, and I have the expectation that the digital twin ocean will have a positive feedback and will help us in answering a question that is largely not solved for the moment. And that is, as Marilo said, the optimization of the data collection strategies. Uh, we all know that uh, collecting data at sea is very resources consuming, time, people, money. Uh, but, but we still don't know in most cases, or we are not sure that we are, uh, whether we are collecting uh, the data in an opti optimal way. Uh, are we collecting the right data? Are we collecting all the parameters we need? Uh, are we collecting them at the right place, at the right moment, and for the right duration? So as the uh, digital uh, twin ocean would allow to conduct large scale experiments that are not possible uh, in the field and to perform detailed analysis 
sensitivity analysis. I hope that uh, it will result so in a significant optimization of the data collection strategies, uh, not targeting an increase of the amount of data we collect, but in targeting the increase of the amount of pertinent information we collect. So that's for me. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think that's quite important because pertinent information is much better than just normal data, I think. Um, okay, Kate, do you want to uh, answer the question? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so in terms of the digital twin ocean, I think this is, we've heard a lot today about all of the ambitious but needed um, and necessary targets through the Green Deal, biodiversity strategy, etc. And I think it's a really good opportunity because it will really open the door if we have this um, truly European capability um, to do such you know, complex or more transformative science that we have the ideas for, but we haven't yet had the, the full capability to bring together the necessary data models and simulations. Um, so I think this is a huge opportunity. And I think there are many uh, people have covered many different challenges and areas. Uh, but I think as um, Serge was mentioning, um, the data is really where it starts, I think, um, in terms of um, we have a good pipeline of data already in Europe. We have, um, you know, data aggregators and data services like eModnet Copernicus, which are single single entry points, if you like, to a lot of in situ and satellite data. But we need to, you know, take this forward. And I think the DTO is could um, be a huge opportunity to then diversify and really bring in all the necessary data data into a sort of common workspace, if you like, that could then enable big data science. Um, some examples could be, for instance, if you think of the coastal area, which is particularly intensive in terms of human activity and connected to society as well, um, you could foresee that a DTO with its simulation and bringing the models and all the data together could then um, have more you know, continuous um, real-time monitoring that would engage citizens, but it would also be useful for the blue economy in terms of um, operational tools, decision-making um, that would um, ultimately save costs potentially, or even save lives in the, the instance of a, an early warning system, for example. So I think these are the types of complex interdisciplinary uh, activities that the DTO could potentially um, do. And that would bring together, of course, marine environmental data, both in situ and satellite, but then also the human activities element um, and socioeconomic information as well. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I think we have not been able to get Christian's uh, phone to work. So I'm going to go to my second question and hopefully we'll be able to get him eventually. Um, I'll also remind people that you can also put questions and answers in the question and answer section. Um, please don't make it a Sheila show that I have to ask all the questions. It'd be nice to hear from other people as well. Okay, so my second question is, um, what are the main challenges in developing the, the digital twin ocean and how can big data help us overcome them? Um, and I don't know if Fabian, you want to go first again. Um, yes, let's try. So first, I will uh, I will answer to the second part of the question: uh, What can big data help to be overcome? And um, so, for the big data, uh, that's clear that big data uh, will help us to learn, uh, to learn a lot, uh, to learn from this data because we can have uh, can now have access to technologies like AI, machine learning, deep learning, new networks, plenty of new ways of dealing with data from which we can extract information like uh, low signals that we cannot see with numerical modeling and, and so on. So big data is really something that will, will bring whatever we know, we know or don't know, but it will bring something because we will learn something that we don't know just by manipulating data. So this is really something important. However, uh, all of that is valid if uh, the data are there, so they are collected first, we, say, we said it already, but also these data are ready for being used by this algorithm and by AI and so on. So we have plenty of data, but there is quite, quite a lot of do, uh, to do before to have really operational big data, I would say, meaning that these data are heterogeneous, which is a, a strength, but also a weakness, 
and they have to be machine ready to be read by this algorithm so that, to train the algorithm so that we can extract knowledge from it so big data is is very important but this is this will help us to solve challenges but it's it itself it in, it in itself it's a challenge so the first step is to be ready for big data which is not yet the case i don't think so even if we have plenty of little things available already so as someone said right so i don't know <laughs> yeah no, the second no, point right. uh, the second point is what are the main challenges in dto for me um i will uh, i will look at the challenges which are not technical and which are much more about the programmatic of uh, implementing and deploying the digital twin uh, ocean. Uh, really, the main challenge for me is to achieve something at short term. Because uh, uh, while preparing, I would say, a long term roadmap, because in fact, uh, the ambition set by Destination Earth and the digital twin ocean and all the twins is extremely high for plenty of communities, scientists, policymakers, DGs, commission, and so on. So even citizens, uh, uh, we, we get in a few months an emphasis on destination us, which is crazy. So the expectation is very high. We can do plenty of things, but uh, if you listen to everyone, ideas are, are good, science is there, but a lot of science remains to be done, a lot of science. Why we want to demonstrate something at short term? So this is where it's challenging because we need a lot in terms of core science, a lot in digital computing, a lot in system in integration of all of that, and a lot also with the users so that they change their behavior, they trust this kind of digital services uh, of new uh, with new information. So all of that cannot be done in two years, five years, or even ten years. So for me, the big challenge will be to really uh, marry a top-down approach with a vision and a bottom-up approach where we can achieve, where we can demonstrate, so that we keep the momentum and we re reach uh, uh, the success at the end. So we really have to set up a realistic approach while uh, that, that build on something which is already available, which is precursor, which is not perfect, which doesn't which doesn't solve everything but exists so that we can start implementing something and therefore we have already building blocks with Imonet, with copernicus with blue plan atlantos interos odyssey you must plenty plenty of projects so we really need to have a realistic approach building on that and in parallel we have to build the long-term vision and we have to build a several roadmap like a scientific roadmap of all what has to be still developed validated all what we have to do in terms of um, managing the uncertainties of what we produce, uh, an integration roadmap of all of that, and an outreach roadmap, how to communicate with citizens, with decision makers, with the social and, and you know, social science and humanities, so that they are in. Because at the time, all of that is really listened and, and, and brought and promoted by the ocean community, but social science is not there. So we have really to link with them if we want to make something different from what we have today and, and better. So really I would advise that, that we work with these two strengths, a realistic approach where we don't dream and we want to do something. And then the long-term vision with different steps of work to be commonly built with everyone uh, so that we work on this last mile using AI, combining AI with models, um, collecting more data, preparing this data to be used, and then uh, identifying uh, champion users, but uh, innovator users that are ready to change their behavior and, and the way to address their problems uh, using different kinds of data and new forms of data. So. This is for me the challenge. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, I will go to uh, Marie-Laure. Um, if you can give us your idea of what do you think are the biggest challenges that data can help overcome. 
Thank you, Sheila. So yes, so a lot have already been said by, by Fabian very nicely. And uh, like her, I would like to, 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 to stress technical challenge, but also as important and maybe more important the challenge to connect to the people. So first for the technical challenge, I, I am quite aligned with what Fabian said. So we mentioned that uh, we will produce high resolution uh, information from the data and from the models, uh, big data, artificial intelligence development. So this will require uh, access to high performance computing infrastructure. And it will also require that we adapt our numerical codes to the new low energy hardware that we will have in the future, such as the GPU, for instance. Then after we have so the, the, the challenge to handle this big data, but it's not only the amount that is difficult to handle, it's also the device, the, the different type that we will have. So different time we will have ocean data, but we will also have social data, marine activities data. So it's a diversified set of data, different, different types, different originators as well, from scientists to citizen, including the private sectors. And we will have to make this data interoperable complying with the FAIR principle that we talked about previously, and with, uh, with, and with what is very important as well, a consistent quality control and flagging and transparent available for all the users. That's also very important. Then after, when you have this data set, you have, of course, to analyze them, and that's very important as well. You have to combine the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, with mechanistic modeling as well, in order to grab the information and to challenge the understanding that we have from the complex processes, to test the finding that we, we, we have and also to, uh, to, to see how our prediction fa face this new data set. And then we have to have a critical attitude and I really uh, appreciate the, the, the talk that was given in the morning by uh, Linwood Pedalton about that concept of having a critical attitude in front of the data and the information that you can have from this data to be, to be critical as concerned the quality of the data and the information that you can get from them. It's, 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 a, it's also a real challenge. Then after the second challenge, uh, which is not technical, but it's the challenge to engage and to establish trust with a diversity of users from the private sector, from the public sector, and from the society in general. And so in Copernicus, for instance, it's central. It's uh, this perspective of connecting with the user is central. So it's really a user-driven and policy-driven uh, program. So we will continue like that. So the, uh, the access to the data is done through the Wikio platform that is shared with UMEDSAT, ECMWF, and Marketon International. So that platform has continued to evolve with allowing cloud computing facilities. The data has to be uh, made available in a transparent way and the information has to be provided. So now we work with a central service desk that interacts with the user, so user can ask the question. Then uh, uh, feedback engaged to the user uh, through partnership. So we have partnerships so far with professional association like Ocean Energy Europe or the European Aquaculture Platform. Training is also very important to train the user to, to, to use the data and to help them to understand the information from the data. And for the future, it has to, to, to continue, it has to evolve. And what is important is to co-design the tool, the application with the user in order to be sure that it, it fits the expectation. And for instance, the scenario, the what if scenario is probably very important and has to be designed with the user. Now, the last point was how can big data help to overcome this challenge? So I agree with Fabian that the big data is the challenge, but it's also probably part of the solution for engaging with the user and to succeed to, to make this engagement and to import the citizen. So we'll have at our disposal a large diversity of data with a unprecedented resolution. And this will uh, be very appealing for the society, I guess, for the kids, for the teenager, for education, to make them aware of what's happening in the ocean, what are the pressure in the ocean, to tell story, as it was mentioned just previously. And then I, I really think that 
this DTO will allow us, uh, we allow the user to feel what's happening in the ocean and to play with the data, really to understand, and not just to see that in the television or in the media. So that's the few things that I would like to mention for this question. Thank you. Thanks, Marilor. Serge, your, your chance. Yes, there is apparently a large consensus amongst us, so I will again rephrase some, some of the considerations that have been expressed so far, because uh, as many of us, and it was also mentioned in the previous sessions, um, one of the biggest challenges for me is the realistic modeling of the many complex interactions character characterizing the marine processes. Uh, at physical, chemical, biological, socioeconomical levels, to, to only name a few. Um, and this challenge is not only about our capacity in to understand and to describe these complex uh, processes, but it also implies for the scientists to develop new ways of working by enhancing the integration of different disciplines in, in a context where specialization is often still a main driver for a scientific career. I re remember having participated a few years ago in a multidisciplinary study on fisheries. And one uh, of the reviewers said to us, you are committing academic suicide because we, he, he told us, you will never be able to publish because all the journals are specialized. And uh, this is very, uh, well, this, there, are, there is a need for an effort towards more multidisciplinarity. Um, and I think that big data can help uh, by using artificial intelligence and the related techniques like machine learning, deep learning, or uh, uh, data mining to let patterns to cover this part of the uh, describing the complexity of the, the processes uh, to let patterns emerge from the available information and to enabling, therefore, the, the uh, more accurate modeling. Uh, but as said by Marie Laura, others, big data is part of the solution, but uh, there's also a lot of challenging challenges still remaining for developing big data itself. Uh, not all the data network nowadays are ready to handle and huge, the huge amount of data that is expected to come in the future. And they, these networks, uh, I can name CDataNet, I can name MNet, uh, need really support. Um, the, the efforts like those currently undergoing in the Envy Fair project uh, for improving the fairness of the data made available by the various environmental research infrastructure must be continued. We have the diagnostic, we know that not all the research infrastructure are at the same level in the various aspects, aspects of fairness. So we need to uh, work together on that. And I also have big expectations regarding the use of artificial intelligence intelligence for drastically facilitating and improving the quality control of the data as also mentioned by Marilo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge. And last but not least, Kate. <laughs> Thank you very much. So picking up on what Serge has just mentioned, actually, first on my list for a big challenge is um, truly fair data. I know it's come up a lot today and there's the fair plus the care and, and the trust, but I think in terms of the interoperability and the reusability, so that the really trusted um, data provision and the provenance of the data are absolutely crucial to this because the data will be the cornerstone to feed into these models and simulations. And those you know, mathematical equations and computing um, will only be so good as the sort of real data informing it if we're, if we're really going to reduce the uncertainty of predictions um, and simulations. So I think that's a sort of first um, challenge and it's crucial for also then being able to produce truly big data. So not just high volume, but really heterogeneous data that we, we can bring together from many different sources. And that's the whole purpose to then bring in all the data from not just um, the public sector, but also the private sector um, and society itself through citizen science as well. Um, it's crucial for the model interface, as I mentioned, 
Um, it's crucial then for um, eventually, hopefully, um, twinning with other digital twins because there will be others in different domains. And if we want to tackle, um, you know, the land sea interface or coastal region, for example, it will be really crucial to bring the climate and ocean and the you know, land and ocean uh, interface together. Um, and as um, Ward was saying in a previous session, it's crucial, interoperability is crucial for then this international data ecosystem, which in effect, um, all data can be used for many purposes um, and ultimately it can solve you know, international um, challenges also. So that was the first on my list. Um, second was the, the challenge of as we're scaling up towards automation and having the potential to have more, more big data. Um, I think it's, it may have been mentioned already in terms of the quantity and, and quality of the data. So we could potentially have the the option of having a big data sets, but we need to definitely scale it up and make sure that we're doing that in a stepwise process so that um, it's done in a structured way so that the big data are really um, usable and fit for purpose. Um, and then third is less uh, of a technical um, solution. There are clearly technical challenges to be made in the, the modeling interface, but I think another real challenge is the real, like the true connection to society. There will be great opportunities for visualizations of data, of using those simulations to really engage citizens, particularly maybe environments like the deep sea, which are less um, connected um, to us um, as more coastal. Um, and we can really take this forward, I think, to connect to society. But there's also then um, looking at how we could connect to all the different users. So creating a kind of interface with this DTO that all society would feel connected to, whether you are um, a marine scientist or a less um, informed, you know, professional, uh, different professions, or um, an a citizen who just wants to go to the beach and, and look at really um, the virtual reality of what your coastline will look like. I think there are so many different users um, that we need to bear in mind um, and that could be um, enabled with this DTO, um, which is really exciting, but it's also a challenge and it would obviously evolve as well. Um, so I think going forward, um, that connection will really need to be uh, met. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay, so we've had um, responses from everybody. We have two questions in the question and answer, and I'm gonna ask them, they're not specific, specifically anybody. So anybody on the panel can ask, answer them if you want. The first one is from Dominic Durant, and um, he's from the Norwegian Research Center, Norse. Um, and his question is the ocean community, including Copernicus researchers, data managers, and so on, is a robust community, but it's also a very closed and conservative community. Um, so as an example, the community is struggling to build competences in the internet of things and artificial instead of intelligence instead of collaborating with the best partners on this in Europe. Uh, how do we make the ocean community evolve and open um, that they can seek new partnerships and be more creative, um, address you know more efficiently the challenges, um, so that we can build the digital to an ocean um, in partnership with industry, public uh, public authorities, and citizens. It's a really hard one because it's not really about data. I think it's about people, and I think um, I don't know if anybody wants to have a go. Kate, yeah. Yeah, for me, it, it is about the, the people connections in terms of um, having that dialogue with industry and other diverse sources to show the win-win benefits, um, you know, of them really sharing their data. And then if they can see that, then they're much more likely to engage on co-developing and um, this type of thing, for example. Um, you know, if you ask agriculture industry or uh, what they would need, they would really um, see the benefit, I think, of um having more sort of marine forecasting or predictive capability around in the localized area around their aquaculture farms. And if um, they would see the win-win of sharing the baseline marine environmental data that is around their farms together with all the different um, farms in an area, then you can start building a picture and building marine, marine forecasting that would benefit all you know, the, the farms in an area. Then they're more likely to share their data which then in turn um, will drive more innovation, I think, in, in their industry as well. So I think it, it's having that dialogue and then um, you know, bringing in together with uh, the data science and the information community as well. Thank you. Does anybody else want to try and answer that question? Because I think it's a very search, yeah? Search first and then Marilor. 
Yes, I think uh, one way to, to, to improve uh, this uh, cross-fertilization is to, to have, I don't know whether they exist or to use if they exist, a specific instruments, uh, funding instruments that, that promote this kind of uh, cross-domain uh, uh, um, well, fertilization. Uh, that's what we do in Enrifer because we mix the competencies uh, of um, the terrestrial domain, the atmospheric domain, the, the sea domain, the biodiversity domain, and we also have uh, people there uh, whose specialization is mathematics and, and statistics. So they are not at all uh, linked to the, the domains we are covering. But I think we need more of these opportunities in the funding uh, mechanism. Uh, if I can add, I, I know that under um, a lot of the Horizon projects, you have to often have you know, companies involved. So I think that is definitely a way least with, the, with this, the new call that's out on the digital twin ocean, that, that could definitely be included. Uh, Marilor, you had a comment as well? Yeah, so briefly, so I agree with what Serge just said previously and uh, what Kate said. So we, we have tooling, that's sure, but for, for instance, in the, in the marine Copernicus, we have uh, regularly a uh, call, and uh, this is for the service evolution, for instance, or for the development of downstream application using the products. And there, uh, is, so anyone can, uh, can can apply and to develop some uh, uh, tool like artificial intelligence to handle big data. So that's opportunity that uh, exists, uh, could be uh, enhanced, but uh, there is already some uh, some opportunity to the to, to collaborate with, with Copernicus with the community in large. Uh, Fabienne, did you want to comment on that as well? So I have a comeback on that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Um, uh, I agree that the ocean community is a bit uh, close and conservative. It, it used to be, um, but it was also its strength. And that's why we, we developed so quickly some solution in terms of ocean forecasting and ocean climate compared to what did the meteorology. And uh, so it was a strength. I think we open already in the, and that's something that we saw in Copernicus, for example, because we started with physics, ocean physics, very structured, the international level. And now we have linked with the biogeochemistry community, which is a completely different one with the new people. And uh, by integrating these two types of models, we have opened the door. And we are now working with the, the ecology uh, community, uh, working on marine ecosystem models, which is completely different again, and much less structure. So this is a way to open. And I think we are opening. Definitely the digital twin uh, ocean and destination are in their principles to open to so, uh, social science, citizens, decision making, will force the ocean community to open more and more. So I think this, this will happen. Another way to open is uh, by education. And I think the next generation of our students um, won't be less conservative as we do maybe because they learned mathematics differently and they learned also about uh, computing science differently. And especially in terms of big data or AI and they can bring new ideas and less conservative way to address uh, ocean knowledge and all what we have discovered. So the next generation of students will bring something else and will work differently. So it will open also by definition because they are from the digital age and we are not, um, or at least the, the conservative uh, ocean community, <laughs> which did a brilliant work, by the way. And the last point is uh, at the commission level, what we want to do. Uh, at the commission level, we have decided the. Uh, uh, for the next NFF to um, build uh, uh, overarching missions uh, on five topics, uh, which are which are going from soil to cancer to oceans. These missions, uh, driven by the Commission, have the intention really to to open completely a topic uh, to make it extremely visible um, at the European level, at the world level, and be becoming central in how the Commission how the needs to implement uh, their policies, uh, their science, and so on. So we have a mission ocean 
Inside this mission ocean, we will discuss about how to improve knowledge, but we will discuss also how to raise awareness about the oceans, uh, um, inform citizens, make citizens active in the process, complete, so it's completely open, uh, improve education, improve um, information exchange, citizen science, um, and, and reaching uh, up to the citizens. So going really from a scientific perspective that we had in the past to something completely large, open, and scaled for it, ambitious enough, with, I think, billions behind. So I think the ocean community is opening a lot. Thank you very much, Fabian. I will say, um, Marilor said that, um, you know, Copernicus is, is, is ready and open to work, uh, you know, and there's, and there's the possibility to work with Copernicus. I think the question was more, how do we approach them? Because they're not going to come to us. So that's the thing that I think we need to think about because, you know, these guys get a lot of money. They don't need to play with us sci marine scientists who don't have a lot of money. So we need to find ways that we can interest their, make, you know, get them interested in our problems so that we can work closer together with, with industry. I think it's something that we need to think about. Um, then we have another question from Slavomir Sagan. Um, more of a statement, but maybe people will want to respond to that. Um, he's saying that the digital twin is an ambitious idea. Um, it really works well in the tech world. Uh, systems elements and interactions are known and well described. Um, in the ocean, there's unfortunately lots of processes and interlinkages that are still unknown um, or have very high uncertainty in the level of description. Um, so he seems to think it's too early to describe it as a digital twin. And he says it's an ex excellent goal. And yes, it would be great uh, for investing in research. Do you guys want to come back on that? Because I think, well, I'll go first. I personally think you can't know everything. Uh, maybe you can in a, in, if you're building a car, but you definitely, in the, in the marine world, you can't necessarily know everything. But that's not to say you shouldn't try. And I think if we start building the digital twin, then we'll find out the things that we need to know. That's my answer to that. I don't know if anybody else wants to have a go at answering that question. Marilo? Yes, I agree with you, Michelle. It's, it's totally true. And the other point is, uh, so the, 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 the question is totally right. So we do not have the level of uh, accuracy with the blue, green, and uh, white ocean. Uh, for the physics, uh, we are very close to the accuracy of the weather. For the green ocean, it's not the same because there, is, there are a lot of empirism in the equation, the evolution equation. Sorry, Lord, can I ask you to, to define blue, green, white? Oh, sorry, excuse me. So the blue ocean is the physics, so it means the currents, the hydrodynamics and the temperature and salinity, sea surface elevation. The green is the biogeochemistry, so argal and nutrients and uh, yeah, so yeah, so, so plankton, and uh, the white is the sea ice. So for, what I was saying is that for the for the blue ocean, uh, the level of uh, accuracy of the forecast it's uh, very comparable to the to the weather to the atmosphere. But for the green ocean, it's not the same because we do not have this uh, Navier-Stokes equation for the biogeochemistry. We have a lot of empirism in the in the formulation of the equation. That's true. But we expect that in the next 10 years, we will better constrain our model because, uh, for instance, uh, there is a plan from those to have 1,000 uh, BGC, so biogeochemical argo float deployed in the ocean. We heard just before that there is this genomic data. And for the satellite, we are also expecting a revolution with the hyperspectral uh, information. And already Sentinel is already bringing a lot. So we really hope that in the next 10 years, we will be able to better constrain this, uh, by, by this green and also the white ocean, the, the, the sea ice, and to improve the accuracy of the blue ocean. So that's true. Uh, it's not perfect, especially for some part of the ocean. But uh, in the next 10 years, we really hope to, to do a lot of progress due to the evolution information from the big data as well. We will learn a lot from the data for the parameterization using combination of artificial intelligence and mechanistic modeling will allow you to better parameterize the model and the data will allow to better constrain the model. So I think it's a, it's a very good timing, very interesting timing. Thank you. 
Thank you. Does somebody else want to answer that question as well? Uh, Kate? Yes, so just to complement what's been said, um, it's clear that a, a DTO would develop and wouldn't be able to achieve everything sort of immediately, but I think it would be a really good focal point for then uh, sort of empowering people to want to share data. So we could potentially have a, a step change in that from the much wider community. And that would in turn reduce the uncertainty because if we're getting more diverse data sets and higher resolution, that there may be you know, many more data sets out there that we don't know that once we've integrated them and can map them and then use them for these, these models and simulations, um, it may actually you know, be less uncertain than we think. And then we can much more clearly identify the gaps. And as people were saying earlier, have a sort of feedback mechanism to um, you know, then, uh, inform the next developments of either data collection, but also the potential simulations as well. So I think, um, yes, it's uncertain still, there will always be, the ocean is vast, um, but I think uh, it would be a good focal point to then uh, bring all the right uh, you know, data together to, to solve the problem. Thank you. Uh, does anybody want to say something else? We have a question in the chat from Anna, but if anybody wants to still answer on the last question. Yeah. Okay, so then there's a question from Anna Hermsen. Uh, the EU manager for TNO, I don't know what TNO is. Uh, one of the current challenges is also the need for a paradigm shift. He, she says, Leonardo da Vinci taught us a long time ago that the integration of disciplines lead to innovation instead of the side of thinking academic specialization strategy. Um, so she, I mean, science integrated with completely other fields such as culture, art and music, not just the integration of various science, scientific disciplines. Um, and uh, Fabian has uh, agreed with that, saying that the Mission Ocean is something that that's what it's going towards. Um, I will say that that comes back to something that I was going to, a question I, I actually asked, uh, I had for Marie Lohr was uh, you talked about um, mapping or linking to ecosystem services, but actually I think we will, through what we have at the moment, we can link to things like, you know, sea surface temperature or those kind of things. Uh, but we're not going to be able to link through to cultural services or so I think art and that kind of thing um, will definitely make a big difference. And I think we need to find ways of integrating the fields of natural science with social science, um, with humanities, with philosophy, with psychology, with art as well. So I don't know if anybody wants to um, com comment on that. Fabian, did you want to say more? You you answered in the in the panelists. Um, I, I agree that um, I agree with Anna that uh, we need a paradigm shift. Uh, but you know, I think it's very difficult to to have a paradigm shift in just asking for it. And um, so Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, was a, an inventor, a big innovator, and all of that was recognized centuries afterwards. I hope we won't need centuries for it. And so it's really about evolution or revolution. To make a revolution, you need to have all the people, you need to have the money, and you need to be all moving in the, in the, in the same way, the same path. We are not yet there. So at minimum, what is important is to at least uh, give the conditions so that it evolves uh, more quickly than, than what we do today. And so I think this is also the perspective of the Destination Earth and Digital Twin Ocean. They, they express something extremely ambitious, which is of the level of Leonardo da Vinci. And then we will see what we can do with uh, all of us together, all with what we have in hand and the money we have. So, yes, I agree in principle, but then it's what is affordable, what is realistic, and, and let's progress already. About going to museum and to meet children or to whatever, this is something which is listed in the mission ocean. It, it has been sought, then we have to do it, and it won't be done in, in very, very quickly. But being being um, having keeping in that in mind uh, is already a very good step. So we have to keep the track and build the track together. 
and sustain it in time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Kate, yes? Yes, I was just thinking in terms of, I mean, a DTO, it could start with, you know, the big data sets that exist. And if those could be visualized and really engage with society, um, you know, showing big data in near real time and um, changing um, in education centers, that I think these types of examples are just the tip of the iceberg that can then inspire, you know, many more innovations. There could be many disciplines that could see um, a link then to the ocean if they feel more connected to it. And then that could, you know, in turn spin off many different um, societal and cross-discipline and transdisciplinary actions. So I think it's just the beginning. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry, any other responses to that question? Um, if not, uh, we have one um, more question open um, on uh, on the question and answer. It's from Mark Portier. It's quite a long question, so I'm not 100% sure where the crux of it is. He's basically saying that um, we basically talked about AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, uh, but we've not looked at uh, the other side of real big data that addresses distributed computing, global scaling, semantic interoperability, queries, eventual consistency, and, and so forth. Um, and while it's largely acknowledged that uh, the need and possible impact of big data is only uh, really vaguely been referenced by Ward Appletons, uh, the underlying next level of challenges are coming our way. So I think this is a question really about how do we make it happen in the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to answer that question. Serge, you look like you have an answer. <laughs> Yes, I, I fully agree with Mark's statement, uh, but the, the topic is, is the, the digital uh, twin ocean and not the big data today. So uh, we couldn't go into all the challenges uh, we have with uh, data handling. I mentioned a few, but indeed, uh, as we look to big data with the definition given in the statement, volume, variability, velocity, and we can add uh, other things like validity, um, it's, 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 a, it's a big challenge by itself. And uh, it, it's not, um, we, we see big data as a, uh, as a way of leveraging the digital twin ocean, but we have also to meet to make huge efforts in making all these data more available, uh, more interoperable, the fairness again. Uh, and well, this could form, but you have a, uh, the, uh, the Marine Board has produced an excellent document on that. Uh, we could have uh, another interesting uh, forum and conference on the topic of the data it's itself. Good. But um, well, this, this is indeed something that we at the level of the data management are trying to tackle. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to answer that question? Yeah, I can, I can probably uh, answer very quickly to Mark. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so first of all, we always say big data, machine learning or AI, because this is uh, quick names. And uh, we want to embrace behind these names, uh, this wording, all what is behind. And we are not enough specialized to make the list that you did. But it includes it, that's for sure, for everyone. And so that's the first point. About data, uh, we are clearly not, uh, um, we also, uh, I think, made the step uh, to forget copying data. Uh, this is really about linking data. We, uh, linking and accessing data or moving computation where data are, are and, and these kind of processes and challenges that we have to reach uh, to solve at the technical level. That's, that's for sure. We will not copy any more data. Um, so I think the two points that you raised are completely um, identified. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think we will close this session. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. It's been absolutely wonderful. It's been great, um, a, a really great discussion. And I think I, for one, have a better understanding of all the problems that we have behind uh, getting this digital to an ocean off the ground. 
Um, I think if anybody has any more questions, you can um, ask them still in the question and answers and we will make sure that we send them to the panelists to answer. Um, but for now, I would, um, and I would remind you actually that we have the, um, somebody, I can hear somebody, <laughs> that we will have the uh, link to the YouTube uh, video of this will be, um, it's, uh, we'll, it'll be on our website. Um, so now we will move to the closing session. And uh, the closing session today will be um, given by Ricardo Serra Santos. Um, and Ricardo is, hold on, I've lost my piece of paper. Hello, Ricardo. Ricardo is um, the Portuguese Minister of Maritime Affairs. He was also a MEP for Portugal from 2014 to 2019. Um, but most, more importantly for me, really, is that he's actually a biologist and an animal ecologist, and he's basically focused on the deep sea. So I've known him uh, from a scientific perspective, which is great. Um, he's linked to the University of Azores and the Institute of Marine Research and, uh, and, the, and the Oceanographic Institute of Paris, the Portuguese Academy of Sciences and the Portuguese Navy Academy. So Ricardo, it's wonderful to have you here and uh, please go ahead and give your intervention. Thank you. You hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I want to start by greeting the chair of the European uh, Marine Board and my uh, cher ami, usually uh, Gilles Le Ricolet, also uh, the executive director of the European Marine Board and dear friend uh, Sheila Hymans, and through them all the European, Mar European Marine Board participants and uh, all the invitees. Uh, I also know that our dearest friend and ocean champion from the European Commission, Sigi, Sigi Gruber, will be closing this forum. A big hug for to you, uh, Sigi, if you are listening to me. And I must say that I miss you all. I miss Kate, Britt, Ward, Lindwood, Andrea, all and all. You know, this pandemic COVID is really a big shit. Uh, but we have the chance of the digital era and uh, um, of the digital times, and here we are. And uh, thank you very much for inviting and uh, uh, thinking of me to intervene at this 2020 European Marine Board Forum. Uh, and the digital is, in fact, a great tool. In f and I remember that the first uh, European Marine Board Forum in 2008 was addressed to discuss marine data challenges. And 12 years later, here we are discussing how to deal with a lot of it, how to deal with big data in marine science. As you know, I've been involved, deeply involved, and you mentioned that with uh, the European Marine Boarding, including uh, vice chair for some time, and uh, pursuing its role of to translating uh, marine science and into policy recommendations. You have all these great policy papers that are very important. And this is an important task. And being a scientist uh, all my life, uh, working with the European Marine Board, I've been sitting in the European Parliament now in my current role, I strengthen my convention to look at science as fundamental to supporting governance, good governance. And this is particularly notorious in the light of the great calamity of our time, but in fact predicted by oceanographers, and I want to raise this point, predicted by oceanographers since the middle of the 20th century. And this is, of, of course, the climate emergency and the issue of global warming. And no scientist, no philosopher, no intellectual, no honest thinker question that we are in an emergence of climate change and we have to add. It's not, and to know. It's not a question of believing or not. It's not a question of optimism or pessimism. The climate crisis we enter was predicted by chemists and oceanographers long ago, at least since 50th century. And the data information that we possess is come from observation and monitoring the marine environment from the coastal zones to the deep sea, in situ or remote, allowed to clearly link the ocean with climate change through understanding the ocean as stabilizing force of biogeophysical processes, particularly in regulation of the carbon cycle. And it was the, the 
their laborious, tenacious, and persistent work of Charles Killing of collecting time series on, on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, together with the work done by Roger Revelle in the 50s. And I know there was today a mention of the work that has been continued in Hawaii, where Charles Carling was doing all this work. And uh, the data information that we possess allowed to perceive the evolution of the ocean state and the problems of the ocean is facing. And they are a lot. Acidification, lowering of oxygen, increase in average temperature, change of currents and coastal process, impacting fisheries tremendously, the presence of plastics and other pollutants. The more data we, we possess, would mean more information we have to face these problems with the best available knowledge, with information. But this is not necessarily the truth. There is a disparate and large amount of data sets that demand a large capacity for data processing and the, at the interoperability. If we integrate uh, and well also a terrestrial data to the clear linkage with the state of, of ocean, as you, Sheila, and Anna Taller mentioned previously, or social and economic data, that challenge is even bigger. But we need to integrate all this together. Coping with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the Urban Maritime and Fisheries Fund, the Marine Special Planning Directive, with the EU Green Deal and with the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, two documents that the European level crucial to address the Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals, all these instruments and what they require call for a very large, very well integrated, accessible and up-to-date information on the marine environment. European has been doing uh, a lot, eventually even in the front run in this with EMODNET and the Coper Copernic Marine Environment Monitoring Service, support by the European Research Infrastructures and by major research uh, development uh, projects to deploy ocean observatories uh, at sea and collect marine data. Uh, this call of the reason 2000, uh, this, that was uh, mentioned today, 2020, towards a digital twin of the ocean is ambitious. Having a, a near real-time digital ocean, multi-dimension with high resolution. This is totally aligned with the proposed mission Starfish, and it is also a clear linkage to the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development when identifying as one of the six needs of the global society, a transparent ocean with open access to data, information, and technology. This digital twin of the ocean opens tremendous possibilities. For instance, a very dynamic and adaptive marine spatial planning across the seas of European member states, as was mentioned by Felix Leinman today from DigiMar or this morning, the possibility to better perceive the impact of multiple stressors and the, on the ocean with multiple origins. In Portugal, we are, until the end of this year, now performing public consultations aligning our national ocean strategy to 2030 and the digitalization of the ocean is one of our target uh, areas and to come to a conclusion i would convey to you two messages my first message and i believe this is an excellent perform platform to do it is that new knowledge and new technologies can not by themselves solve major threats on the ocean. Governance and new policies, either regional, national, aligned with global and shared concerns are paramount. And in that concern, I congratulate to the fact that representatives of several directorates general of the European Commission are present here today or have been present here today. My second warning is that a rational and emotional linkage of the seasons to the ocean is much needed, as governance is not a dual relationship between scientists and, and politicians. In that sense, information informed citizens on the challenge of the ocean that the oceans uh, um, 
uh, faces will promote social acceptance and social authorization of political measures based on science. Storytelling, as mentioned early in the afternoon, is indeed an effective tool. Ultimately, we must reach the people <clears throat> and convey that the most fundamental and powerful message said by Silver Earl, and I quote, you should treat the ocean as if your life depends on it because it does. Okay, and I close here. Thank you very much. Chile is the one that I see here in the screen. Uh, but uh, to all uh, of you, a big hug. Sorry, it's a pity that yeah. COVID is a big shit. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule. Um, and I don't see any questions. I don't think there's any questions for you. So I think we will go now to Zugi Gruber. Um, and I see Ziggy there, so that's great. Um, so Ziggy is the head of the um, Healthy Oceans and Seas Unit of the uh, D D DG Research and Innovation. Um, that is basically the unit that, trans uh, that tr uh, supports the transition to a healthy planet um, and uh, to a climate neutral by 20 2050 and so on, and has worked very hard, long and hard on the mission, um, mission Ocean or the Mission Starfish as it's called now. So Ziggy, um, it's lovely to see you, even if it is only in the square. So um, over to you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Hello, Ricardo. What a pleasure that at least we can share a screen. Hello, Jill, and all ocean friends um, of the European Marine Board, but also all the others. It's, it's a great pleasure and I am also, I really uh, fully agree with Ricardo that the COVID is really, I think, overshadowing uh, what we do, but we have, uh, we have to fight it with all means. So let's instill as well uh, a positive message and the message of hope to everyone and all my best wishes to all of you and all your loved ones that you keep safe and healthy. Now, uh, Ricardo, you challenged us because you said the, the twin is uh, ambitious. Of course it's ambitious. Whatever we have been doing in the last years has always been ambitious, but we haven't done it on our own. And so that is why we have worked a lot with you and it's really a pleasure that you are there as well. And we have worked with the European Marine Board. Actually, yesterday I was cleaning out and uh, you wouldn't believe, but I kept all the office and I uh, kept all the reports because they are a great source of inspirations and will be so also, I am sure, for the next years. So let me uh, go back now and, and do a little bit of closing. I have uh, been with you now for one hour. I have picked up uh, some issues. And I wanted also to give you the perspective from our point of view, from the research and innovation. Why is it so important? It has been all the time now highlighted. If we don't have healthy waters and oceans in future, there will be no life. And I think this is something we cannot repeat uh, strongly enough and often enough uh, to not to ourselves, but uh, to many, many peoples and citizens. And we know that biodiversity is collapsing, has collapsed already. The seas, uh, the sea level is, uh, is threatening us. Uh, I heard today in another talk that uh, in 10 years, 20 uh, cities in, the, in, in the Southern Europe will all be really threatened by the sea level rise. So that is why we need data. We need data, we need science, we need management of data. We cannot just do without it. And when the Commission took office, I mean, it has launched the Green Deal. It was the number one priority with the overarching goal for really making Europe climate neutral by 2050. This is very ambitious as well, <laughs> and it is, but it is our roadmap for action. It sets out our vision, our long-term vision on how we can really achieve the necessary environmental, social and economic transformations. I think the, fr the three really dimensions go really together because what we need to strive is for a fair Europe, for a cleaner Europe, for a greener and for a bluer 
Europe. I always add the blue dimension, let's not forget that. We are indeed, um, the, let's also not forget that we have put uh, also the Green Deal is the, is the motor and compass for the recovery coming out of the crisis. Because we, can, we have a, a new reality, we cannot forget that. We are now at a critical moment of transition where data collection and data management, as well as science, is shifting from observer to actor, from evidence to prediction to models, which are absolutely necessary, from research to policy evidence, and from innovation to infrastructure. We need more data, this has been said as well, highlighted today. We need more science to light really the way through the 21st century. We need to instill confidence that what we make out of this data is actually bringing the solutions back to the citizens. It's the, the famous st storytelling that has been the, explain, the explaining why is science and why are data so important. And yes, we have we have really put a focus, we have put one billion to publish a Green Deal call. And don't only look at the pilot for the twin. I know that that is really what is important for the ocean community, but we have also had really, we have put a lot of emphasis that in the other parts of the call, there are also, there is always as well the aquatic dimension. Look at the biodiversity call, look at the one from the farm to fork, Look at the number 10, which is actually looking more at the social behavioral and skills development. Take it really as a whole package. Don't miss out on these opportunities. And then let's look at Horizon Europe, our future program for research and innovation. Again, obviously very ambitious. And the green, uh, the missions, the, the, the so-called Green Deal missions, as we define them, they have already been anticipated by Fabienne, so thank you for Fabienne, but let me, I cannot give a talk now and not talk about our future mission ocean. Starfish 2030, that's the title which has now been proposed to restore our ocean and water. Uh, this is now under scrutiny by the Commission services because it was handed over by the mission board, but whatever the title will be, whether it will be this one. What is important, the starfish has actually, for the first time, it combines the system of different interfaces, different parts which condition the health of our ocean and waters. And we have to take the system's view and we have to take the system's approach if we really want to make a difference. You can criticize it. We also struggle because we have to see how we can take this forward because it is enormous. And, but what is important is that we want to see how can we really deliver the solutions? What are our citizens expecting from us? How are they going to handle knowledge and what you can actually make real through a twin yeah? because there is this gap between the we have a, an enormous knowledge gap we have an enormous gap of the citizens towards ocean and waters because they're not understood they're not they're not seen they're, they're too frightening we have an enormous gap we we know zero the pollution is devastating it biodiversity is collapsed as i said we need to decarbonize the economy and we need a new system of governance if we really, and this has also been mentioned by Ricardo, thank you for mentioning it. So let's see how we take this mission forward. And we, I mean, data will be at the heart of everything I have mentioned. So stay tuned with us. Fabienne gave also this metaphor of the, the Leonardo da Vinci, that we have to bring the enlightenment back to the enlightenment of the ocean and the waters back to the people. That is why the data is important. But I also wanted to mention another initiative that is in the pipeline, which is a future European partnership on a, for a climate neutral, sustainable and productive blue economy, where we, you know that we have all these sea basin strategies on the Mediterranean, for the Atlantic, for the North Sea, for the Baltic, for the Black Sea, which 
if we are not careful, we ourselves fragment. So we wanted really to bring all this together and see how can we combine, how can we align, how can we develop a strategic research and innovation agenda by bringing together what the member states are doing at the member states level and what we are doing at EU level. And so if we look at data collection, that will be one of the key pillars of such a new important partnership. Also the infrastructure part, and the different uh, ongoing observations, which are under the, 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 the chairmanship and under the mandate of the member states, that will be as well, that forms a really key part. So that is where we are working on. And of course, in Horizon Europe, we have throughout our different clusters opportunities for new call for new uh, funding, where the fair principles, which have been evoked many times today, will have to guide. It will be a must. So all these different initiatives, opportunities, will also underpin the UN decade of ocean science, but also other decades, the one on biodiversity, the one on seabed mapping. So we have, we have a huge agenda ahead of us. We cannot do that alone in our offices in Brussels or now at home. <laughs> so we really need to take this further with you at the political level, at the level of the stakeholder, at the level of citizens, very important because we have put the focus in Horizon Europe on this notion of, of co-creation, which should not be on the rhetoric, but which should be really translated and bring citizens in so that the solutions that we are going to strive and fund bring the solutions that they need. And this is something where I wish everyone to keep yourself active and dynamic and to continue to work with us. We need you, you need us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ziggy. Um, yeah, that was great. It was wonderful to hear from both of you, the, the really the, the, the political policy sort of backbone of making it work. So. I think uh, the only thing I have to say is that I'll, I'll close, but I want to close by saying, um, yes, it's, you talked about how, you know, how ambitious the biodiversity strategy is, how, how ambitious the digital twin and the mission and all of that is. Um, and, and, and Ricardo mentioned the, the importance of, of um, good governance, um, citizen science, that kind of thing. And I think from the Marine Board perspective, we are there, you know, uh, I think we will do anything we can to make it, make it happen. It's very ambitious, but to be honest, it's not just ambitious, it's critical because if we don't do it, we are very much in trouble. You know, if we don't deal with these problems, it's only going to get worse. So, so the, I think from the Marine Board's point of view, the, the scientists are behind you and we will do what it takes to make it happen. And I think I will leave it there and just say thank you very much to everybody. Thank you um, for all the people who were there. Thank you, Jill. I see you, you're back in, in the school. Um, and yeah, so thank you for our speakers in the in the closing session and in the final panel, and to all of the people who uh, spent the day with us. It's been great to see you guys and to have this discussion. And we will continue the discussion um, uh, in, on our LinkedIn page if anybody's interested. And um, the recording, as we said, will be made available.